everyone. Now this is the, you know, the last and the best talk uh, in the in the bootcamp. No pressure. Uh, so essentially, Aaron Seedford will end up uh, the you know the the session on the interior point method and also the last session of the bootcamp with his talk. To long term, term participants, remember that there is an all hands meeting at 3 p.m. in the same room. So please come here because we need to discuss important stuff about you know, what will we do after such a great week uh, of studies. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction and for having me, and thank you very much to the organizers for putting together such a wonderful program for the week. Uh, and thank you to all of you for sticking it around to the bitter end of uh, boot camp uh, and coming back even after lunch on this lovely day. Um, so today I'll be giving the last talk in the series of uh, talks I've been giving on interior point methods. And the last few talks, I think, have gone really well into the details of interior point methods. I think you've, we've all seen a few very nice presentations of the proofs of how interior point methods work and how they can be analyzed. Um, but given that it's the end, that it's the end of boot camp uh, and it's after lunch and it's at the end of the week, I thought I'd end things by giving a little more high-level view of some of the recent developments of interior and point methods and give a little bit more of a geometric explanation of some of the things we've already seen earlier in the week. So the focus on this talk will be giving another sort of high-level geometric perspective on interior point methods, going over what the actual end-to-end -end algorithmic complexity is of using of interior and point methods in a variety of contexts. And hopefully you'll get a sense of some of what some of the leading, leading cutting edge research happening in interior point methods is and how you can use them down the road. And since I guess also because it's the end of the boot camp, I might go off on a little bit of a rant of what I think some of the big open problem directions are in interior point methods. So the plan for the talk is as follows. First, to warm us all up after lunch, I'll recap what we've seen just about basic linear programming and interior point methods. I'll use this to springboard us into discussing what the actual best end-to-end -end runtimes we have right now are for linear programming, and I'll make some combinatorial connections there. And then I'll spend the bulk of the talk talking about some of the fastest algorithms we have for linear programming, these interior point if methods and go a little bit more under how to leverage geometric perspectives on interior point methods to build uh, these recent fastest algorithms for solving them. And at the end, as we have time, I might uh, go off and talk about, I think, a little bit more in detail some of what I think the big open problems are in interior point methods and or or break down, I think, the obvious open problems in interior point methods into, I think, some arcs that a few, myself and a bunch of other researchers have been exploring. So that's the plan. Uh, the main bulk of the talk, when I go into this analysis of this geometric perspective and I go at start talking about how to leverage it to get faster algorithms. I'll be primarily there talking about joint work with Yin Tat Lee, who is, I think, finishing up his last week as a postdoc in Microsoft Research and starting as a professor at UW uh, next week, I think. All right, so that's the plan for the talk. So let's take it back uh, to where we were at the end of the last sessions on interior point methods. Uh, like the previous talks, our main focus will be on solving linear programming using interior point methods. So our central object for the rest of the talk, we have an arbitrary linear program where we have some n variables x, we have some, uh, some d variables x, we have some cos vector c. Our goal is to minimize the inner product of x and c. And we want to do it subject to n linear inequality constraints given by some constraint matrix a and some constraint vector b. Now what I've written here is just the dual of a linear program in standard form. Uh, it's similar, no, I'll be using similar notation to Maji, but I think I changed the, the dimensions a little bit. So another little tweak on the setting. Um, but we've seen this before. So this is a general linear program. And then this will be our main object of study, but I'll note uh, a lot of the analysis I'll be doing does extend to general convex programming. So if you want to be thinking of a bonus problem, I guess, as I go through the rest of the talk, you can think about where am I really using anywhere about it being a linear programming throughout the rest of the analysis. All right, so just a quick refresh. What do these things look like? Uh, we have these n inequality constraints. Every inequality constraint defines some half space in Rn. Um, the intersection of these n half spaces is our feasible region given by x equals b. Um, it's going to be this high dimensional convex body I'll call a polytope. Uh, whenever I draw the feasible region for the rest of the talk, I'll just draw its contour in blue. And whenever I draw them, I'll always have the cost vector that we're doing pointed straight up. So for the rest of the talk, our goal is to find the bottom of this high dimensional convex body. And that's our goal. All right. 
We've all seen some discussion of the standard methods for solving them. There's the simplex method where you walk along the boundary of the bolytope towards the bottom. There's ellipsoid or cutting plane methods, which we saw a little bit more about earlier today, where you start with some large convex set that contains the entire feasible region, and we iteratively shrink it till it contains nothing but opt. And there's interior point methods, which is what I'll focus on, which, as we've seen, walk around in the interior of the polytope. Now, I think there's a number of reasons to study of interior point methods, a number of which have already been discussed uh, a little bit earlier. In general, I think they're worth studying because they're just a very pervasive, robust convex optimization framework. If you want to solve optimization problems that are possibly very ill-conditioned, something like gradient descent won't necessarily converge fast. And if you want a very high precision answer, so you want very good dependence on the accuracy you're aiming for, like polylogarithmic dependence on your error threshold, then these are often a tool of choice, at least in theory, and in many cases, the fastest algorithms we have in practice in a variety of contexts. And unlike maybe uh, cutting plane methods in a variety of contexts, as uh, Stephen, I think, very well articulated earlier in the week, um, often the interior point methods can do much, much better than the best theory for them we, actually, uh, we can actually predict by their theory. Um, beyond this, as theorists, I think they're worth studying because I think one of the main points I'll try to emphasize when I go through some of the geometric views of interior point methods is I think they actually provide a very nice lens and a rich theory for sort of thinking about the geometry and thinking about the structure of convex sets more broadly. So by thinking about the progress interior point methods make and how fast or how slowly they run and what they are actually doing in every single iteration, I think underneath this, it's a good lens for finding a lot of structure and optimization problems you want to solve. Um, and also for, as I'll talk about a bit, for a variety of optimization problems, the fastest algorithms we have for when the optimization problem is a sufficient amount of structure, um, in many cases, and in the number of cases is only growing, the fastest algorithms we have uh, in some way, shape, or form use interior point methods. And there's many open problems. All right. So let's refresh. We've seen two, uh, I think, interior point methods. There are two key ideas behind them. Uh, the first key idea is to stay in the interior. Right? They all work by starting in the interior of the polytope, maintaining a feasible point, and walking towards the bottom. And the other key idea is to really stay in the interior. <laughs> so as we've seen in uh, both, uh, yeah? A point of clarification on this, because this came up in Steve's talk. Uh, yesterday, it's like what inter what interior, right? Because what's weird, like especially with the infeasible yeah. methods, is it's just about trying to make sure that the the yeah. slack variables don't go to zero. The x's and the, the x's and the yep. s's. So what is that the interior of if we're doing the, the infeasible method? So there, I guess the idea is you're turning there you're turning infeasibility into a soft constraint. So the idea is you want to have a nice way of quantifying infeasibility or quantifying whatever you do. So I think there you're defining a way that you're trivially, in, uh, you're tri trivially feasible, but now going towards certain sets of the constraints lets you quantify how infeasible you are. So it gives you a nice way of, well, I was going to say the next point is sort of quantifying things like distance from the boundary from cost functions, which in the context when you run these things originally in something interior is quantifying the trade-off between infeasibility, the distance from feasibility, and the cost function you're trying to optimize. But a really good question. That answer? Totally, totally, totally. Cool. All right. So, so saying the other idea is to stay in the interior. So the other idea behind all the interior point methods we've discussed, I think rather, rather implicitly, uh, as we saw with the primal dual methods, or, or very explicitly as we had in the path following methods, is some idea of quantifying our distance from the constraint set. In the primal dual methods, we were explicitly maintaining bounds on uh, complementary slackness, which was how far we stayed away from the constraints. In the path following methods, we explicitly kept around this barrier function that penalized how far we stayed away from the boundary. So the key idea in all of this is that we want a very formal way to sort of trade off caring about cost functions and distance from constraints. All right, now before I give what the actual best end-to-end -end running times are of interior point methods, and I talk about um, their complexity when used to solve uh, linear programming, uh, I should give a quick disclaimer. As we've seen, interior point methods don't refer to any one specific method. And like all the methods, I think many of the methods we've seen this week for solving uh, optimization problems, they instead refer to a fairly broad framework for turning difficult convex optimi difficult optimization problems into sequences of much simpler optimization problems. 
So I think if you want to talk about a variety of different interior point methods and you want to talk about their running time, while for something like linear programming, you can ultimately say what the end run time is for linear programming, I think to understand what's going on, it's often very helpful to break down the analysis of these methods into two pieces. One, how many subproblems do you solve? When you're trying to solve this difficult optimization problem and using this framework to break it down into a number of simple problems, how many problems do you need to solve? And how hard are those subproblems? Right, so in the case of the interior point methods we've seen for linear programming, the number of, we've talked a lot about the number of iterations, that's how many problems we're going to solve. And there, the iteration complexity was always doing some sort of Newton's method. And so the uh, Newton steps, the question is, what's the complexity of forming that linear system and solving it? All right. um, I, in talking about the running times for interior point methods, I'm not going to distinguish too much between some of the different perspectives we've seen of primal dual or predictor corrector or potential reduction or path following. Um, for more of the classic results in terms of runtime there, um, each of these, met, uh, in terms of theoretical analysis, they all get essentially the same bounds. Um, although there's a bunch of interesting work to go between them, and there's a variety of advantages and disadvantages. So I'll mainly focus on uh, this and, and a little less on the actual structure. Okay. All right, so with that in mind, what's the actual running time needed? Uh, what's the actual running time of interior point methods for linear programming? Um, so here I'm writing the, sort of the history of theoretical improvements to interior point methods for linear programming. Um, here I'm just writing the number of iterations as the number of iterations need to get one more bit of precision. So I'm just dropping things like log of initial error over final error, or how many bits of precision you need to actually round to a feasible solution if you do a feasible start. So just giving the rough number, uh, the number of iterations they need and the complexity of each iteration. All right. So the first proof of an interior point method running in polynomial time is due to Karmakar. And there, the number of iterations the interior point needed was proportional to the number of constraints of the linear program n. And the complexity of every iteration of that method was comparable to that of solving a single linear system, or in particular, uh, solving a single linear system. Now, it wasn't an arbitrary linear system that you have to solve. As we've seen, it's the, of the type uh, we saw when Steven did his analysis earlier in the week. Essentially, the running time of every iteration of Karmakar's method was dominated by the cost of projecting a single vector onto the image of A under some rescaling of all the rows. So the, the linear system you have to solve is essentially a regression problem that looks like this, where D is just some diagonal matrix that you should think of rescaling every single row of A. Or another way to say it, the cost of every iteration was that of solving a certain linear system in A transpose A under, again, this rescaling. Uh, this was improved by Renegar in 1986, who showed that there, you can get a method, where is he? By Renegar in 1986, <laughs> showed you only need square root, you can improve this to square root n number of iterations, where the complexity of every iteration was essentially the same. And across a broad range of parameters, the fastest algorithms we have in theory, and so recently were primarily a variant of Renegar's algorithm tailored to the specific instance. However, in general, for solving a linear program, the number of constraints can be much, much larger than the number of variables, and the convergence rate then of this method can slow down. However, fortunately, there were these two very cool results of Vaidya in 1989, who showed you can get algorithms that depend just a little bit better on the dimension of the polytope D rather than the number of constraints it takes to write it down n. And you could get this improvement with an interior point method that takes just a little bit more, a bit more time per iteration. Instead of having the cost of every iteration being that of solving a certain regression problem or a certain linear system, you should think the complexity of every iteration of these methods was dominated by the cost of either writing down the entire projection matrix, which you can do more or less by solving roughly n linear, uh, n linear systems, or the complexity of computing at least the diagonal of this matrix. Okay. So, so you can get a better rate, but you have to do a bit more, a bit more work for every reiteration. Um, this was further improved by a very beautiful result of Nesterov and Nemirovsky in 1994, who showed that you can improve these methods to have a number of a given interior point method with a number of iterations you need just dependent on square root of the dimension. So you can fully improve from square root of the number of constraints to square root of dimension. 
Um, but unfortunately, the cost of every iteration of this algorithm involves solving a subproblem that was more expensive than linear programming itself. All right, so if the first time you hear this, this might sound a little silly. If I give you Oracle access to something that's strictly harder than solving linear programming, I should be able to solve a linear program in one iteration just by solving the linear program. But what was really interesting about this result is in a strong sense, this is not what they did. Instead, what they did is they showed there exists a single barrier that depends only on the geometry of the polytope, not the cost function they were trying to optimize, called the universal barrier. And they showed that if you build an interior point method using this barrier function, then this interior point method converges at a square root dimension rate. So in some sense, you could think what they were arguing was that if you understood the geometry of a polytope well enough that you could construct this more sophisticated barrier, then in theory, you should be able to get an interior point method that converges at the right rate. Just didn't address sort of the complexity of sort of getting that structural understanding of the particular polytope you're trying to optimize over. Uh, and for the last, uh, for until fairly recently, this looked like the state of the art for um, uh, interior point methods for linear programming. It looked like you can get methods that depend better and better on the intrinsic dimension of the polytope D rather than the number of constraints N if you were willing to spend more and more time per iteration. And it looked like there was a natural trade off you'd get there. So the main results I'm going to tell you about uh, or build up to by the end of this talk is work uh, uh, Yin Ted Lee and I did in the last few years that showed you need not have such a bad trade-off. Um, you can get an algorithm that up to polylogarithmic factors has the same convergence rate of the universal barrier while having iteration costs that are comparable to that of Renegar's algorithm, just solving uh, computing projections onto the image of rescalings of A. So if you want to use this result to get uh, algorithms for linear programming, you just need to look at the complexity of solving every single linear system, uh, solving a linear system. And if you use recent work on stochastic methods or subspace embeddings for solving linear systems, the best running time uh, we have for implementing every one of these iterations by itself is a uh, time that's linear in the size of the constraint matrix, basically linear in the size of the input plus the time needed to solve a d by d linear system. So d to the omega, where omega is the matrix multiplication constant. So that's what you get from directly using this result. However, it's been known even since the first work of Karmakar showing that interior point methods that can be solved in polynomial time, that you can often get wins on improving the overall running time to execute an interior point method by leveraging how much the linear systems you're solving in every iteration of an interior point method change. So it turns out when you run all of these methods, in some sense, the fact that they take a number of methods to converge, you can actually tie back to bounds on how much the Hessian or how much the linear system you have to solve in every iteration of these interior point methods change. And you can show on average they don't change by too much. And even since the earlier, the first work of Karakar, there's been a sequence of results showing you can you exploit this to make the cost of solving each linear system sort of cheaper and cheaper on average. Yeah? So do you have to solve the linear systems exactly, or approximations are enough? So you only need to solve them. So you only, let's see, the linear, whatever, no, you only need to solve, what's the best way to say this? So you, only need, you don't need to solve them exactly. You can quantify the number of bits of precision you need in, you need in the answer. Can you just use subspace embeddings or one of these methods? Running? Yeah, so, so that's exactly that's where this runtime, exactly. That's where that running time comes from. Right, you only need to solve them up to like log the accuracy you're aiming for bits of precision. You can quantify it. And from preconditioning, that means you actually only need to be able to solve a linear system of a approximately related matrix. You don't have to actually solve for the end matrix. So there's a bunch of uh, sequence of work showing you can get better and better running times. We showed you could adapt those that work to this, uh, to this result that has a slightly faster rate, so things change a little bit more. And combine it with all the sampling tricks so you can make it so that, on average, the cost of solving the linear systems are as if the matrix multiplication constant was 2. So the runtime you get for linear programming is uh, the size of the linear program times square root of dimension plus dimension to the 2.5. 
So what I want to do in the rest of the talk is tell you a bit about the geometric insights that underlie this result and how to think of going from something like Renegar's algorithm to the slightly better convergence rate. But before I do that, this is a, a program on bridging continuous and discrete optimization. So I thought it'd be worth talking a bit about, I think, one of my favorite combinatorial problems, the maximum flow problem, and how these results relate to getting faster algorithms for combinatorial problems like the maximum flow problem. In particular, I want to discuss this problem, so I think it serves as a nice problem on the boundary of continuous and discrete optimization that highlights, I think, the difficulties in both approaches to get faster running times. All right. So for the next little bit, this is as a quick aside, think about solving the maximum flow problem. So here we have a directed graph G with vertices V and edges E. We have some non-negative capacity on the edges U. We have two special vertices S and T. And our goal now is to send as much stuff as possible from S to T without exceeding the capacity constraints. Right. It's one of the most well-studied problems in combinatorial optimization. And until the last few years, the fastest algorithms we had for solving this, result, uh, solving this problem were the seminal, the seminal result of Goldberg and Rao that showed that you can compute the maximum flow in a running time that's the smaller of the number of edges of the graph raised to the 3 halves and the number of edges times the number of vertices in the graph raised to the 2 thirds. Okay. All right, so how does this compare to all the linear programming and tier point machinery we've been talking about? Well, it's not too hard to write the maximum flow problem as a linear program. We simply add an edge from T to S. We say we want to look at the set of flows such that the flow on, uh, into every vertex is the same as the flow out of every vertex. That's just a bunch of linear constraints. Now, however much flow we put on T S is the same as the amount of flow that'll go from S to T. So we just want to make a cost so that we put as much flow on our TS edge as possible. And we just want to make sure that we meet the capacity constraints. So if you just try to solve this, and if you just take the standard, uh, the standard linear programming formulation maximum flow and try to apply Renegar's result, or use the log barrier to solve, or any of the methods we've seen to solve uh, this linear program, you immediately get an algorithm that solves this linear program in square root of the number, sorry, in square root of the number of edges iterations. Right? So, uh, so now if you want to look at the actual complexity of these results, you can look at the actual linear systems you'd have to solve in every iteration, the actual Newton steps you'd have to implement. And it turns out here, if you're trying to solve this linear system in this matrix, matrix transpose, you can show that this matrix is symmetric diagonally dominant. And using this beautiful, powerful, very influential work of Spielman and Tang of 2004, you can show that you can solve every one of those systems in nearly linear time and the number of edges in the graph. So if you just put these two things together, which Deitch and Spielman did in 2008 along the way of achieving some other cool results, you get an algorithm for solving maximum flow that essentially matches the best running time we had for combinatorial results, at least in the regime of sparse graphs. So in some sense, this shows that the maximum flow problem was a natural barrier for sort of the limits of combinatorial techniques and limits of continuous techniques. Whichever you apply, it seems like this number of edges the three halves, at least in the case of sparse graphs, uh, shows up. So now, you know, you can imagine where I'm going with this. I talked about how you can get faster interior point methods um, that depend better on the dimension of the problem. You would think, well, there's only V vertices. This seems like the intrinsic dimension of the problem. So you imagine the first thing I'd, I would try to do, you would try to do is use that result to get a better running time for maximum flow, to have only squared number of vertices iterations rather than squared number of edges. Unfortunately, things are not quite that simple. Um, doesn't work right away. If you look at this linear programming formulation, we have n equality constraints here, number of vertices and equality constraints. But we have this number of edges two-sided inequality constraints. So this problem is number of edges dimensional. And if you take the dual in any, uh, try to take the dual of it and write in any sort of standard form, you still end up from the two-sided inequality constraints getting something that has number of edges, uh, number of variables. So it's at least not clear how immediately in this formulation you can use the same off-the-shelf machinery to get a square root of a vertices iteration count. However, it turns out you can use the same machinery nevertheless to build an interior point method for this constraint set that still converges at a rate that depends just on the number of equality constraints, which for max flow corresponds to the number of vertices. 
Uh, and this gives you, and putting those together, you do get an algorithm for solving the maximum flow problem that gets a uh, number of edges times square root of number of vertices in terms of runtime. Yeah? So in, in, in practice, we, we really would expect that you're just getting about e. I mean, O of e. I mean, in practice, it would be much faster. Yeah, but, so, but, would you, but would it actually, are, just, are I don't know, is the question for the crap. Does anyone actually solve max flow problems using a jerk one No, because the standard algorithms are even faster. Yeah. So they're also, these, these upper bounds are also... Very, yeah, yeah, yeah. so okay. essentially things that we know in worst case take quadratic time. In practice, they work in... Oh, the quadratic time? <laughs> yes. I know. Yeah. Again, wait a minute. Uh, 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 that's not one of the less glorious, you know, uh, use case of asymptotic theory, uh, of worst case complexity. So, uh, but, like, so if the, the picture changes the moment you move to the mean cost uh, max flow, uh -huh. then the existing algorithms are not, like, the commuting algorithms are not as good, and actually then, you might want be tempted to use kind of like people use network syntax usually because it's still right performs better. But oh yeah, the at, at least there is there is a clearly like a right. need for you know for for something like like that. Sorry, a quick question. Mm -hmm. Not a corollary. Do you have to go through white data machinery to get the formulation? So we end up just uh, building a barrier for this two-sided constraint set and arguing that you can still do path following on this set that converges at square root number of equality constraints rate. So we end up just showing you can do path following on it directly, even though there's not a universal barrier for it. Yep. And I'm on the record. So I've, I've heard, I can tell you more, talk to you more about offline. I've heard of a number of attempts to use the interior point methods to solve max flow. And I guess there, there's also the question of using the linear system to solving machinery faster. I didn't ask that and, question. Huh? I didn't want to open up that can of worms. Well, <laughs> well you, you asked how fast uh, well they do in practice. I mean, uh, people have been optimizing it more recently yeah, yeah. in yes. light of these results. So all I can say is that uh, I got one of very smart uh, graduate students very unhappy with me when I asked him to implement my algorithm as a project. <laughs> so, uh, he was quite disappointed with the uh, uh, practical uh, okay. practicality of it. So. <laughs> well. I was gonna say, in theory, I still think it's incredibly exciting times <laughs> to be in studying interior point methods. Um, there's been a number of recent results showing and giving evidence that in some cases we can possibly go beyond standard self-concordance theory. Um, Alexander talked about some results yesterday he has on modifying interior, uh, perturbing the central path and modifying interior point methods to get a faster algorithm for maximum flow in unit capacity graphs or it's even faster if the graphs just have mildly bounded capacities at this point. Um, it's also been used uh, different ways of modifying interior point methods to the structure problem and used to get faster albums for a shortest path with negative edge weights. And there's been recent work showing that you can use it to solve even some continuous optimization problems like geometric median and nearly linear time. So I think with all these results together, it means it's exciting times possibly to be studying interior point methods and better tailoring these methods to the structure of problems to get faster algorithms. All right. So that's all I'm going to say about maximum flow and the running time of linear programming. What I want to do in the rest of the talk is talk a little bit more about the geometric perspective we use to get this faster running time for linear programming and speculate about some open problems. Any questions on this before I go on? All right. All right, so to build this result, let's uh, take, a, take it from where we were at the end of uh, Alexander's talk the other day. Uh, we'll take as a starting point a basic path following approach for interior point methods we talked about and talk about how to modify the use of the logarithmic barrier to get faster algorithms. So what we saw yesterday is the way these path following methods work, path following interior point methods work. So we want to minimize, solve this linear program. We assume we'll have some nice barrier function p defined on the interior of the polytope, such that the value of the function goes to infinity as we approach the boundary of the polytope. And the way we'll optimize then over the polytope is we'll consider pra uh, parameterizing how much we care about minimizing the barrier function versus how much we care about minimizing the cost. So what we'll do is consider some penalized objective function pa uh, parameterized by a path parameter t, where t will denote how much we care about minimizing the cost versus how much we care about minimizing the barrier. And what we'll do is consider the minimizers of this penalized objective function for varying values of t. So if we take t to be 0, 
we're only minimizing the barrier function over the polytope, which corresponds to getting some sort of center of the polytope induced by the barrier. And if we then take the limit of increasing t, we're minimizing more and more the objective function while staying just enough to away from the boundary function for the fact that it's going to infinity not to kill us. So in the limit, this will go to the optimum, the minimizer of the linear program. Um, and as we saw from the talk, the way the, these path following methods work is we typically do some initial transformation to get some point that's close to some central path point for some value of t. What we do is we increase the path parameter by some multiplicative constant. And then we do some Newton steps to compute the next central path point, and we repeat. So we start at some central path point, increase t, use Newton to get the next central path point, and continue until we're at the optimum of the polytope. All right. And to recap, the analysis of this method boiled down to essentially two facts. The first fact is that we had assumed that our penalty function p was self-concordant. What this means is that we made an assumption that the Hessian, how much it changes, is bounded if we move our point by a bounded amount in the Hessian norm. So we can bound changes in the Hessian by movements of points in Hessian norm. The way you usually think about this, it says is if you take some point for this barrier function, you do a change of basis to make the Hessian the identity. Then what it says is if you move in a ball around that point, the Hessian stays looking like the identity. Which then, from all the talks we've seen earlier this week about first order methods for optimization, that means if the norm of the gradient in this change of basis is small, meaning a step of gradient descent won't move you too much, the Hessian still won't change too much, and locally everything will be well conditioned and converge quickly. So thinking about that, what that means with undoing the change of basis then tells you that if the norm of the gradient is small in the Hessian inverse norm, meaning the size of the Newton step is small in the Hessian norm, then if you take a few steps of Newton's method, you'll rapidly converge to the central path point. Every step will, make, will have your error or more. The second property we use to then analyze these path following methods is that we assumed in some sense the total force exerted by the barrier was not too large. So here we're making an assumption, self-concordance is assuming that the barrier doesn't change too quickly. And the second assumption, so it's fairly stable, like it's pretty principled where you stay. And the second function we're saying is somehow though how much it pushes you isn't too hard. So when you look at going from one central path point to the next, things don't change too much. Uh, there should be a gradient sign there. <laughs> Aaron, yeah. I just wanted to say that this, you know, uh, scary looking expression uh, over there is exactly the Newton decrement from my talk. And it's uh, exactly the same constant. Yes. Yo, I, I stole it from your talk. Yes, Great. that's why I picked one tenth. Yes, so forgive me for not saying it. That's no, exactly no, why I, I did it. Yes. Exactly <laughs> the same thing. I even mentioned this is like the, du the dual, uh, the dual local uh, norm of the yeah. gradient. So. Yes. Uh, to totally agree. This is yes. This is the same as the Newton. Agreed. Um, yep. Um, right, and uh, the analysis uh, Alexander essentially showed was that if you have the property that the norm of the gradient and the Hessian of the barrier and the Hessian inverse norm is less than nu, then this says if we increase the path parameter t by uh, amount that depends on nu, right, then we can maintain that the Newton decrement is too small. So this, this is exactly what uh, Alexander did his talk to say that you can increase t by a multiplicative 1 plus 1 over square root nu and still stay in the region where the Newton decrement is small. So just having these two properties is enough that you get a square root nu iteration algorithm. Okay. And this is just recapping the analysis that uh, Alexander did. All right, so what I want to do now is say, so what's the picture behind this? What does this essentially say? So if we, it says that if we're trying to minimize a linear program, we have this p self-concordant barrier function. It says that if we look at one central path point t, and we look at the level sets of that barrier function around xt, uh, which is uh, essentially, it looks, uh, it's pretty well-behaved quadratic. It just looks like a quadratic based only on the Hessian. Right? And then what the analysis we essentially, what those two properties imply is that if you increase t by a multiplicative 1 plus 1 over square root mu, then if you look at the next central path point, the Hessian hasn't changed too much. So the Hessians are still comparable. They're only off by some constant. And that second point was still in the region where there was a good approximation to the Hessian for the last point. 
So it says whenever you make multiplicative approximations to the path parameter, but you can actually show it's multiplicative one plus or minus one over square root mu. Essentially, the Hessian doesn't change too much, and you stay in the region where Newton would converge quickly. So you can move forward and backward along the central path. So the way I usually think of this is that these two results together are saying that if we took this original ill-conditioned problem of minimizing a linear program, by having this stability property of the Hessian self-concordance and this property about how much, the bar how much force the barrier exerts, we're essentially saying we can everywhere carve up, the uh, carve up the feasible region into a bunch of overlapping ellipses where we have bounds on the rates that they change. So we can move on between these regions between them. Uh, yeah? So a, a better, a lower barrier parameter, uh, mm -hmm. if, if you were to look at the level sets, would they look more like the polytope or like less? Like, I mean, you know, as the, as, as the barrier parameter somehow gets better. I guess as the, I, it would sort of like as the barrier gets better, the range in which the ellipse is a good approximation to everything gets larger. So let me do the next thing I was going to do. I think I'll make it cleaner. So there's another geometric property implied by the barrier functions that I find a little cleaner that I usually think about. So another way to think about what's going on um, is if you take a self-concordant function, a nice property that they have is that if what you do is you compute, look at the center of the polytope. So what you do is you consider the point where you're only minimizing the barrier function. And if what I do is plot the second order Taylor approximation to the function, or in other words, I just look at the points where the amount, so if I look at the second order, that should be a squared, sorry. So if I look at the second order Taylor approximation, so look at the Deacon ellipse, this is the set of all points such that the distance from the point in the Hessian norm is at most one. This gives you some ellipse that sits inside the polytope. And you can prove that always happens. And if you have a new self-concordant barrier, you can show that if you take that same ellipse and you scale it up by a factor of O of V, so you consider all the points such that the distance they are from your center is at most uh, new, new in the Hessian norm, you can show that that ellipse fully contains the polytope. So another way I think of thinking of self-concordance, this is technically a property implied by self-concordance, is that when you have a self-concordant barrier, it says the center always gives you an ellipse that up to a factor of nu well approximates the entire polytope. Yeah? So nu is independent of where you are. So the way I prove this is technically, this is a great question, the way I say this is technically for the center of the polytope when you minimize only the barrier function. Um, when you're following the central path and now you've minimized some amount of cost plus barrier, the story is a little more complicated, but you should essentially still think you're locally getting a new like rounding to the polytope wherever you are. But you have to carefully incorporate the effect of the cost function. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So another way to think of these properties that we're using in the path following analysis is that what we're requiring is that the Hessian doesn't change too much, self-concordance. And we're requiring that the Hessian always induces this good rounding of the polytope, that it's a good sort of geometric approximation to the polytope around where you are. Um, so, uh, so taking this perspective, if we look at Renegar's algorithm, or the log let's be a little more specific. If we look at the logarithmic barrier for solving the linear program, so this was the barrier where uh, we simply take a point, we look at the distance to every constraint, and we take one over the distance to that constraint, take the log of that, and sum that up for every constraint. If we compute the center for the logarithmic barrier function, this has a special name, it's called the analytic center of the polytope. Again, you can show the log barriers and end rounding of the polytope. So if I take the second order approximation of uh, if I take the second order approximation around the center and scale up by a factor of n, I get a ellipse that fully contains the polytope. All right. And again, you should think that this n is roughly the n in the number of it in the that we take the square root of and the number of iterations in an interior point method. All right. But now, even if I lost you somewhere in that intuition, um, it's not too hard to see that there's something in this algorithm that should depend, something about the rate that should depend more on the particular representation of the polytope, the number of constraints n, rather than the dimension of the polytope. 
And to see that, as a quick illustrative example, suppose we took our instance of our linear program, we took a few constraints, and we just repeated them many, many times. Okay? So we just we didn't change the linear program we had to solve. I just keep adding a bunch of redundant rows in our constraint matrix A. This doesn't change what we're optimizing over, but a quick look at the logarithmic barrier function is it does change the barrier we're working with. If we just repeat a constraint a number of times, essentially what we're doing is increasing the weight on a certain number of constraints. Right? So the way to think of this is you can think in the choice of how the particular polytope we're optimizing over was represented. The adversary and how they give us this representation can choose what weighted log barrier we're aiming for. Right? And the amount of control, one way you can measure the amount of the control they have here is the number of constraints n. Right? So from then, it's not too hard to see that if I do this, it'll actually shift over the central path. It'll push things away from this constraint set and could make uh, the convergence of the algorithm slower. Right? But I think this also suggests a very natural thing to do if you want to improve the rate of interior point methods. And Alexander talked about this briefly the other day. You know, if the issue is the adversary in the choice of giving us the representation of the polytope can force us to work with some weighted log barrier, then a natural thing we should do is optimize over those weights. We should take that control back. And that's the rough ideal we'll explore for how to actually modify the logarithmic barrier to get a rate that better depends on the dimension of the polytope. All right, so that all sounds well and good in principle. However, it doesn't say immediately why you should suspect that doing any sort of manipulation of the weights should give you something that depends on square root dimension rather than square root of number of constraints. I mean, honestly, Aaron, just, yeah. just another question. I mean, not, it's kind of weird, and this does happen as you move along the central path, but like, those constraints shouldn't matter at all, right? Yeah. Like Agreed. Whether, yeah, okay. whether they don't matter for the answer, but they might matter for the algorithm, I think. So, right, so I guess no, if, I understand that. But that's what I'm saying. For the, 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 yeah, the so, in some sense, like, the simplex doesn't look at those constraints. Yes. Agreed. Right. Agreed. Right, okay. so, and um, in some sense, I guess the, the log barrier does decay things, that they matter less and less as you get closer, closer there. I guess the issue is when you start in the middle, you could repeat. When you're in the middle here, you may not really know what's going on. And by repeating them so much, it forces you to run into one of the walls and you could slow down. Yeah, the other interesting point is that actually there are some examples of like worst case examples of this kind of barriers. And they really like brute force this by just having like really, really large weights. Essentially, like they, they really like put some like, exponential size and like weights on, the, on this thing. So essentially, once you allow these things to be really wild, wild things can happen. I believe there's a way to weight the constraints appropriately and repeat things redundantly enough that you can walk all along a Clemente cube and see all the variables. You can imagine cases that's not even quite this, uh, like in this case it's kind of obvious, you downplay it. I guess the worry is if there's a bunch of redundant, like maybe there's a constraint here that's repeated many, many times, right? That would keep you going away from opt. And when you, you want to do, you really want to decay in the beginning. To I was just pointing out that this is already kind of a weird property of interior point methods that other methods don't necessarily have, right? Mm. Right. Yeah. I was just pointing out that no, I'll take this more offline. I'm saying, I'm saying an easy one. You've convinced me I definitely should have had the redundant constraints at the bottom. <laughs> that would have made it look worse. <laughs> um, yeah. OK. Anyway. Uh, all right. Um, Right, so we're saying repeating constraints can change where the central path actually goes. We want to undo is undo this effect, but why should we hope there's a reweighting that lets us uh, actually run at a rate depends on the dimension of the polytope? Well, a quick way to see that is um, if what we're aiming for is a good rounding of the polytope, there's a natural, uh, beautiful result in convex geometry we can look to where it's known that if you take any polytope, or any convex body, and you look at the maximum volume ellipse contained inside that convex body, then that's always a uh, dimension rounding of the polytope. So that always gives you an ellipse that you could that contain the polytope that you could scale up by a factor of d to contain it. So that says at least there's some ellipsoid to look for in order to hope to get a better rounding. And the reason it gives hope for possibly trying to optimize over the weights is that you can show that the John ellipse of a polytope, this derounding, is actually always realizable as the Deacon ellipse of a certain weighted log barrier. In other words, there's always a way to reweight the log barrier so that if you compute that, uh, the center under those weights, 
and look at its Hessian, it gives you a derounding of the polytope. I think this also gives a natural barrier that you would look for if you wanted to try to get a better convergence rate. You could try computing the John ellipse, this maximum volume ellipse, and doing something like maybe taking some function of the volume. We're trying to take something where the Hessian uh, looks like the John ellipse. How do you compute the John ellipse? Um, so just trying to do convergence right now. So I guess in general you would, yeah. Ah, so. Right, so here I guess we're trying to give a space to hope for better convergence rate. Uh, the John ellipse, if you want to compute it precisely, you can, it's a you can write down another interior point. <laughs> and a semi-definite program and solve it. So there's a little, there's some chicken and the egg problem there, but yeah. Oh, because it's maximum. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. But good, good question. Right. Yeah? As, as long as we're dreaming. Um, yeah. First, I thought there was a result that says that for centrally symmetric bodies, then you can do even better than that. Right. right. So is there yeah. that for a yeah. So that's a really good point. Uh, just repeat. Just saying, like, even if you started with a symmetric convex body, and initially you had an ellipse that is a square root d approximation, as you start to go towards any of the vertices locally, things don't look as symmetric. I've uh, had a debate with people about whether or not that fact that you just said is part of where the square root comes from, but I'll, I'll maybe take such speculation offline. Well, the max flow program that you showed earlier, uh, is it true that you get order n I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm uh, happy to chat about that after. That's a really good question, though. Uh, the question was, uh, are we showing that for the flow polytope you get uh, better rounding? Uh, I don't want to. I, I would take me a little too long to think about that right now. Yeah, but you're, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, implicitly looking at the like the symmetrization around the current point at some point. Like, we, let's take this discussion offline. I want to go a bit more into the next steps. All right. So again, so this does say there's some derounding of the polytope to look for. We could try to compute the John ellipse and take natural, natural functions of its volume or something like that to get a barrier. Unfortunately, there's some immediate issues that come up when you try to do that. Um, first of all, if you try to solve the maximization problem over weights to get the John ellipse, you can show that the weights that you would optimize over are not unique. So working in the space of weights over the log barrier is not a very nice one because if you have two redundant constraints, whether you put more weight in one or the other doesn't really affect the Deakin ellipse at all. And even if you could deal with uh, the sort of degeneracy using the weights, if you tried to do any sort of central path where the Hessian uh, was the John ellipse in some weighted sense, that doesn't necessarily induce a smooth path. Like the Hessian can sort of have kinks in how it changes, which would make following it very difficult. All right. So, now that I guess we're through the end of boot camp, but what do you do if you still have this natural sort of geometric object that seems to have all the right uh, sort of geometric properties, but it's slow for the sake of iterative methods because it's not smooth or not strongly convex or changes a little more than it should? What do you do? Regularize. Huh? Add regularize. You regularize, exactly. So that's a natural thing you could do. You could add in some small penalty terms to make sure that the weights you get are canonical and that you can try to make it so that the Hessian doesn't change too quickly. Uh, you can also add some stuff to make the weights not get too small. Basically, you could add a bunch of simple functions to get the weights that you're optimizing over to be much better behaved and then hopefully also have the Deacon ellipse that you're working with uh, more stable. It turns out there's a way to do this and it gives you a derounding and the short answer is that formula will do it. So you could solve this following regularized John Ellipse computation problem. Uh, this as a barrier function will give you something that gives an almost derounding of the polytope. So something that's a derounding up to poly log n. So I don't, wouldn't really, I can talk to you about this formula more offline. I wouldn't try to break it down. The main point too much, the main point is these first two terms you can think are being used to, constrict, to make it so that the, John, that the Deacon Ellipse is a good rounding. And then this term is also added to make sure that the weights are spread out fairly uniformly so that the, the ellipse you have is somewhat stable. And this term is also added to simplify the analysis and make sure that none of the weights get too small. And if you work with this rounding, you can show it gives you an end rounding of the polytope. And this actually gives you a barrier. You can essentially follow with a path following method that gives you um, square root these should each be d's. <laughs> That's a bad punchline. Uh, gives you a derounding of the polytope and a square root d iteration algorithm. All right.
And you can show that this, uh, this actually works. All right, but for, um, but note the proof of this is quite, uh, is a bit complicated. Um, an easier way to do it, rather than directly trying to show this is self-concordant, turns out it's much easier to show that there's a Hessian that everywhere well approximates the Hessian of this function, and that Hessian is very stable. And that turns out to be sufficient for path following methods. OK. But if you've ever tried to look at this result, you might be asking now, why is the proof so long? These results are uh, getting up there in length. This is a little bit of a complicated formula, but it's not that complicated. And essentially, with all our path following analysis, we've reduced analyzing uh, an interior point method using this barrier just to uh, bounding the first few derivatives of it. And like clearly, it can't take that much calculus to bound the first three derivatives of this barrier. Essentially, the main issue that comes up if you try to work with this barrier function is exactly the one that you alluded to. Trying to actually compute the John ellipse is a bit expensive. And even more damning, pretty much anything you would try to do with the barrier of this function will involve computing the gradient of log debt, which will involve computing the diagonal of a projection matrix, which would give us exactly the same sort of slowdown we were trying to avoid in moving to using values methods. All right. So what exactly is this issue, and why should we hope to do better? Um, so again, the gradient computation, what shows up if you do any analysis is in the gradient of log debt. You need to compute what are known as leverage scores, or in the graph case, are known as effective resistances. And they're essentially the diagonal of this projection matrix of a projection matrix pi. So this projection matrix we're using that uh, corresponds to the linear system we want to solve, you need to compute its diagonal. And if you're going to do this naively, you'd have to either use fast matrix multiplication or solve n linear systems to get every one of the diagonal entries. Okay. And that's the bottleneck. Fortunately, there's a very, yeah? I'm sorry, I'm still parsing the, the thing from the previous slide. So your weights are actually unconstrained, right? So, you uh, so I guess we want them non-negative, but we have a barrier for it. Huh? Uh, we want them non-negative, but there's a barrier for it. OK. So, but you mentioned that, that uh, the, the last term prevents them from getting too small. Mm -hmm. What prevents them from getting too large? So here we have this minus sum, oh. sum of wi. So essentially, you'll get that the total weights will either will be O of d log d. Like, good question. So yeah? does, does the entropy term just make it, uh, is that what makes it so that I guess the weights don't change by more than a factor or two or something? When you yeah, so the entropy term is what's adding uh, canonicalness to the weight. So it says if we have a bunch, the same constraint repeated many times, there's a canonical way to assign the weights between them, which then also makes it easy to talk about. So it gives strong convexity to the optimization problem over W, which then corresponds log, to stability in the Hessian. Why wouldn't just the last term, the log W barrier term be enough? Uh, it's not enough. Okay. Uh, is, so that's enough. The last term is enough that stops the weights from getting too small. But it doesn't stop them from only changing by a small amount. It doesn't really give you anything like self-concordance, okay. I don't think. Not that I have a formal proof that it doesn't, but okay. that's so a. Can you say something about the range of the weights, how, how large it gets, like the maximum ratio between the weights? Right, so this, the last, sorry, the last, that's a good question. So the last term we used to make sure that none of them are smaller than roughly d over n. Um, and this will ensure that none of them are much larger than a constant. Probably like two. But you can check. Yeah. Aaron, so just, yeah. This, this is your barrier. This is the this is the barrier for the. No. So this this barrier won't work. This so so no. So this won't work because you can't compute gradients of it. No, Ideally, this would be a good barrier. So this barrier gives you a square root d iteration algorithm. It doesn't give you an iteration cost at solving a polylog number of linear systems. So it doesn't give you faster max flow. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, L last one, and then I'm going to have to. Sorry, to, to clarify, yeah. this is a barrier that if you did use this, you would have to compute, uh, you had to solve an optimization problem at every step to compute the barrier function. Good, 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 good question. But you can already, what, what we show is you can show that the weights don't change too much. Okay. So you can use the fact that you computed the barrier recently to compute the next barrier. And this is essentially the types of issues that we'll have to get through to get. That's a good, uh, that issue will also show up when we try to get this to run fast. Great question. Anything else? OK. All right. So again, we said the issue here was trying to, uh, the issue here, but the first issue is you can't even compute gradients of the barrier quickly, even if you knew the optimal weights. Uh, 
So even if you knew the optimal weights, you wouldn't be able to recenter with it in terms of x. You couldn't implement the Newton steps. Um, fortunately, there's a clever trick that seems like it would help, which is that this matrix here is a projection matrix. So, it turn, so if we wanted to compute any diagonal entry of this matrix, that's the same as computing the L2 norm squared of a column of the matrix, because the matrix times itself is itself. And since then, the, the quantities we're interested in are simply the L2 norm squares of every single column of this matrix. You can use this clever trick that Spielman and Servasto used in 2008, which is essentially that you can apply johnson linden strauss to this. You can take a you can essentially project the projection matrix down to log n dimensions, and that'll give you a multiplicative approximation to the L2 norm of every single column. So if you do this, if you just compute this uh, projection matrix and then multiply from the left, this just gives you essentially the L2 norm of every column up to a multiplicative constant. All right. So this says, hopeful, it says we only need to solve a polylog number of linear systems, which we're in our budget to do. And we can estimate multiplicatively every coordinate of this term that shows up in the gradient. All right. Unfortunately, if any of you have been working with interior point methods a lot, this should raise a really red flag, the idea of using multiplicative approximations to things in the gradient. What's that red flag? Anybody? We, we believe you. OK. <laughs> so the big problem is that uh, things, huh? That you won't preserve zero gradients, which is yeah. not good. So, so if you try to run Newton's method or implement these path following methods, you can tolerate a lot of error in the Hessian. You only need to get the Hessian multiplicatively approximately. However, in order to actually center to go to the central path path, you do need a very precise estimate to the gradient. So just having constant multiplicative error in every corner of the gradient won't let you even certify that you're close to opt. Right? So it's just much more error than you can tolerate. So the way to get around this, so unfortunately we can't quite use this barrier because even checking that you're near a central path point is sort of more expensive than the amount of time we want to spend. So to get around this, what we do is actually go use this Apache pathfinding instead of actually manipulating the weights of a weighted log barrier. So again, we said this idea was if we had the logarithmic barrier, the problem was that we, uh, one of the uh, problems was that in, by giving a bunch of redundant constraints, you can change the central path. And you can think that if your barrier you were using was the weighted log barrier, then every single set of weights induces a different central path you could take through the polytope. So another way of thinking what we were saying before is that by reweighting constraints, you can force the central path to go somewhere else. And if our idea is to optimize over W, you can think this is picking a better central path or finding a better central path to follow. That depends on the objective as well, right? Not just everything you said, just just as about the constraints. Yep. It? But the central path is going to depend on the objective as well. Right? True. 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 So. So so another way to say, it, but I, I guess we can think of that as parameterized through x. But yes. Right. So we were saying we want weights to have this rounding property local to where it is inside the polytope. Um, but the other issue I'm saying that'll help deal with right now is that you can think, though, if you ever are following a particular weighted central path, you have a certain set of weights. This is something that you can actually center on very quickly. Computing the gradient and the Hessian of the weighted log barrier is no harder than computing the gradient and the Hessian of the standard log barrier. So what that means is if instead we were using some weighted log barrier, and the weights happen to have the right properties that it was surrounding, we'd be in good shape because we could actually compute the gradients of that fast and compute the Hessian of that quickly. So the idea is rather than using, solving this joint optimization problem where the barrier comes from maximization over the weights, instead what we'll do is just use the weights that that barrier would have given us as advice over which central path to follow. So the idea is as follows. What we'll do is maintain both x and a set of weights we'll maintain that x is on the central path for the current path parameter and the current coin of weights. So we give some initial point for which that happens. And then what we'll do is we'll take a Newton step on x and w to move x to b as the center of the weighted log barrier for our current set of weights. Right? And then what we'll do is compute on the side some ideal weight function that would give us the same sort of local optimality, the local properties we would have from our idealized uh, barrier and use that as sort of the ideal weights we wish we had at the current point, and move our weights towards those ideal weights. And we'll repeat. 
And the idea here is what weighted, weighted functions should we use? Well, before we were saying we had essentially solved the fo this problem, we minimize over x, and then our barrier would be maximizing over y's, w's of the volume, and along with this regularizer. And the idea is we'll still just use the maximization problem that we were solving here for w as the, like, the ideal weights we wish we had. All right, and we'll move towards that. And here we have the nice property that even if we only have these weights approximately, we can still center efficiently. Right. So, so hopefully we can tolerate the error. Hmm? So um, what, do you need any special properties of the weights to guarantee that Newton steps do get you closer to central path? Because Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, I'll talk about it. I'm running short on time, so I might speed up. Defer questions at the end now. Huh? Right? Huh? Just, you know, short, negative, whatever. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah. All right, so anyway, this is the scheme that we actually use, and we can show that it works. That if you do this where you're centering on x and w and then updating weights from sort of the same maximization problem that would have induced the John ellipse, this converges, always gives you the right local properties that you can move along the central path far and that the central path doesn't change too much. And the idea here is that we're saying we'll alternate between moving down the central path and, optim and changing the weights to find a better central path nearby for us to follow. And the idea then is instead of actually optimizing this like idealized optimal barrier, we're always optimizing some sort of nearby barrier that well approximates it. Um, now when you hear this at first, it sounds like a free lunch. It seems like I said you can't tolerate multiplicative error, and then I just said you could tolerate it anyway. What's difficult about this is the proof that this works is much harder. We're now decoupling these two optimization problems, the x optimization problem from the w optimization problem. So we no longer can argue about this one idealized convex function we're working with. Instead, it's these two sort of disjoint optimization problems we have to prove are coupled together well enough that everything works out. And the other issue you have to do to do this is that, again, we can't actually compute the weights. We can only compute it approximately. Um, so we need, uh, we can't, can only compute approximately, so we have to do work to make sure we can always track the optimal weights. This takes some work, but you can prove there's a scheme that lets you stay close to the optimal weights by the fact that we know the true weights don't move too much and we always get a multiplicative approx. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about that. I have a lot of open, some fun open problems, but I am far out of time. You can show the slides. I can show the slides. All right. One of these days, I'll get to have more than two minutes at the end of a talk to talk about the open problems. Um, anyway, so the, oh, may I just keep it at the joke I, slide? I, 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 like, I like this. I'll keep it as, so the open problems are solve max flow faster, solve linear programs faster, <laughs> and like, uh, solve convex problem. Oh, wait, wait, I, I, have, I, I have this set up. Any questions? <laughs> Anyway, there's a longer rant to do another time. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thanks, Aaron. So, questions? So, is there any intuition like that you're doing sort of a predictor character on the weights? Or is So, so, uh... I, mean, I, 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 I... In your premier description of the, al of the algorithm, but it may be... The, yeah. So, so, so maybe, I, I, li I like the idea for the connection. Um, uh, the question is, is there a predictor cor corrector interpretation of the weights? Which I think is a great question. I guess the one thing is, note there's not much, uh, we're not really doing anything optimistic. Like, it is a short step interior point method. Like, we are moving by a fixed amount every single time. There's none of the, the, the really prediction part where we try to reach far down the central path. Weights is optimistic as ideal, and then you sort of choose less ideal ones to get. So <laughs> Sort of more of the weights, yeah. Right, but I guess we're doing it to deal with the fact that we can't compute the true weights. So if we can compute the true weights, we just do it and be done. And I guess it's optimistic that we're hoping that you can stay nearby the weights. But, but there's a fixed bound on, I'm saying, uh, in the sense that we're guessing, I, I totally agree. I wish there was this part of like we were trying to do something optimistic and reach further down in the path, and that's not currently there in the analysis. But I think doing something like that could be quite interesting. Approximately solving an optimization problem, what's the cost that you pay for that? Right, so what we do is we make sure that the weights 
in that between every iteration are always sort of close to each other multiplicatively. So the weight problem is always locally well conditioned. And then we say with the approximate linear system solves, that's enough that you stay multiplicatively close to the true weights. So there's a few procedure, two, these two procedures wrapped in their one sort of projected gradient to try to compute the right weights. And then another optimization for our guess of the weights to stay close to that guess. And that's, that's how that works. Okay. Is there any way to uh, rewrite the intuition that there'll be only D constraints that are sort of binding at any point? I mean, you take the D tightest constraints and form a barrier out of them, let's say, or something. Yeah, so, so I think there's a great question of can you properly sparsify in any of this? Because right now we're sort of downplaying the impact of all of them, but the, they all make a contribution to the gradient. Like, we don't have proper, one of the open problems that has been, like, can you properly get sublinear iterates for the sake of input sparsity or for solving them even faster. And it's a great open problem that we yes. don't know how to do right now. It wins over what I've told you, at least. Yeah, so just to like say, you know, I always personally like to have a computer program to solve that would you know, uh, emphasize this need. This question would be, can you solve a non bipartite matching using triple matching? It's like we know it's solvable in m, you know, a m root m time. We, you know, the interim method would need to keep and variable. Like, they, you know, we know that the smallest formulation is exponential in size. So it's exponentially many, many constraints, actually provably. So must go somewhere here. Uh, and you know, but in the end, you know, you would think, and we actually know that that there is at any point of time there's only like relatively small number of active constraints. But like, how to make it work? You know, that might be a great open. Okay. Can we hear the rest of the open problem? <laughs> I, 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 I can do it in two minutes. No, we, can, we will not do it in two minutes because I know how it goes. But you can click them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm all for this challenge. I'll, I'll take that, that bet. <laughs> yeah, let's, <laughs> yeah, no, I just clicked to 238. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay, not good. listening to you. <laughs> open problems. Um, all right, first, can you improve interior point methods at its own game? This question of how many Newton steps do you need, how many gradients and Hessian inverse evaluations of the log barrier, open, how many do you need? Upper bound evidence, there's all this cool permutation. A lower bound evidence, there's lower bounds on predictor corrector. Hope, you can do permutation, all sorts of cool acceleration stuff, including accelerated cubic regularization. Other idea, we can do much more than project onto polytopes. We have nonlinear operators for projecting onto certain convex sets we understand well enough. Particular maximum flow, we can project in L infinity versus the L2 that linear assist, that, uh, the L2 that linear uh, interior point method standardly use. Can we use any of the structured results to get a better interior point method? How do you actually use that? Other idea we already talked about, can you do something to get your iteration costs even cheaper? There's all this cool work on being able to solve the inner algorithms uh, very, very quickly. Uh, by sampling, can you use any of the sa sampling stochastic machinery to maybe solve linear programs in input sparsity time? Linear when there's enough constraints. The other idea, this thing that we know the number of constraints don't, then, uh, there's a bound on how many, we know that on average changes the Hessian or low rank. Seems very suggestive of on average slacks are changing or on average long steps over the central path are well conditioned. There's all sorts of things like coordinate descent and SVRG to exploit that. Can we use it? Uh, we kind of did in geometric median, which was fun and I can tell you about later. And I think that was a minute and a half. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I just want to say three things. First of all, on YouTube, you have an option of like having 0 0.5 speed. That will be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the first time I use this feature, but now I know why it is there. Uh, uh, then Sorry. I just wanted to like to finish by saying, you know, thanks so much to Nikhil, Ben, and Pablo for organizing the bootcamp. Thanks to all the speakers. And there will be an all hands meeting at 3 p.m. He made it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, that when we discuss, okay, what to do with such a lovely, like, uh, begun uh, semester. So thanks.